Uh, I would like to welcome everyone here on this beautiful Friday evening. Uh -huh. Beautiful, delicious, thank you, and welcome, uh, one and all. I hope that this evening will be uh, all about educational aspects of genetically modified crops, uh, with emphasis on education. And uh, so open up your minds, be prepared to ask questions, uh, and I hope enjoy uh, a wonderful evening. Before we get started, let me quickly tell you a little bit about uh, how all of this is going to work. There are four of us that will be giving presentations. Uh, and we'll uh, solicit, ask for questions after each speaker. So you don't have to remember from the first speaker after the last one. And uh, our first two speakers are going to be uh, Chris Hardy, who is uh, a uh, local farmer and is, hey, Chris. <laughs> is responsible along with our second speaker, Brian Combs, uh, for uh, putting together, preparing, and submitting uh, a ballot measure that we will be voting on before, on or before May 20th. Uh, so those two fellows will talk first. I will speak third about some science aspects uh, of the phenomenon that we call genetic, genetically modified organisms. And our last speaker is a student here at Southern Oregon University, uh, Cy Weiss, and he will share with you what's going on in a new university program about uh, propagation through sustainable means uh, of, a, of, a, of a food that can be recycled back and uh, provided here at the university. Something that is going on right here in our little town of Ashland. I would like to introduce Chris Hardy, who is our first speaker with our Family Farms Coalition. Chris is a farmer and seed grower. He's a farmer with Mindful Earth. He has been growing in the Rogue Valley for 10 years, um, and he's a world traveler. He is a co-petitioner for the Family Farms Measure 15119, and he's actively involved in the Rogue Valley <coughs> Growers and Crafters Market and the Rogue Valley Farm to School Program. He also does a lot of other things that I won't mention because he didn't tell me to mention them, but I don't know how that man sleeps, to be perfectly honest. <laughs> The, um, our other speaker, and I don't know which order y'all are going in. I get tired, I'll come in and Perfect. <laughs> that, I love that. I mean, I think y'all could have introduced yourselves. But anyway, so Brian is our other co-petitioner, and he is, has been in the Valley for about three years, and he's been coming to the Valley for a number of years. He got involved in the food program through the Know Your Food, Know Your Farmer movement, and we're so glad that we have both gentlemen working with our Family Farmers Coalition. I think you will enjoy the program. You need the mic. Oh, nice. Thank you all for coming. Uh, Chris and I have not practiced this together in advance. I apologize for any disruptions. Um, first off, okay, <laughs> who here is all registered to vote? Okay, if you're going to vote yes, you're not registered to vote, please go register to vote. It's critical. All right, this will be a very close election, so a few yes votes here will make a difference. If you're not registered to vote, we have registration cards in the back. So just please keep that in mind. Um, has anybody seen the opposition's propaganda yet? Yeah. All over the place. All over the place. Well, I'm going to get two myths out of the way right before I start. You all heard about the medical marijuana issue? The medical marijuana issue? Okay, the Farm Bureau, courtesy of our county administrator, is implying that our law covers or would restrict medical marijuana because some, rarely, is achieved through a technique called culturization. All right. Um, it's not my fault the county commissioner and administrators can't read a complete sentence, all right? <laughs> but the result of that is you're gonna see a lot of propaganda and it, cut, and it could, could impact medical marijuana. Well, folks, it's silly. There is no such thing as genetically engineered marijuana as defined by our law, okay? We were very careful how we wrote it. It said that gene doubling 
via or with recombinant DNA techniques, which Ray's going to address this evening, okay, is a genetically engineered plant. The process that Danny Jordan put into the public sphere and that a Farm Bureau has, has seized upon is a product process of taking marijuana seeds, soaking them in crocus juice, and the marijuana within itself modifies itself, but it's not engineered as defined by the federal government or our law. So if you hear it, call it for what it is, pull, okay? <laughs> uh, the second one thing is carnations, okay? Like, you could go to Lowe's and Home Depot and ornamental plants, okay? Might not, might be illegal in Jackson County, okay? And use the example of carnations, all right? I, I, I ask any of you out there to do a little homework. The University of Virginia has a database called ISB. You can look up permits issued for genetically engineered plants. You won't find a marijuana permit. You won't find a carnation permit. There's no such thing as genetically engineered carnations, all right? This is all fear and smear tactics developed by our opposition. They got, uh, and I'm not going to impute motives as to what uh, caused Mr. Jordan to put those things in there. He probably made a, well, I'm, he probably made a mistake or was a complete informed and he had to do something in a lot in a hurry. But well, we'll talk about that later on. But uh, the fact of the matter is, those are canards. They're being used by the opposition to fight this. If you hear about it, it's silly. There's no such thing as genetically engineered marijuana or carnations. Our law does not cover those. Those would not be impacted by our law because our law does not cover it. I hate to get so nerdy to open up with, but that's just, it's been irking me all day long and I had to get it out. So. Okay, um, we got the introduction. This is a guy named Jared Water. Now normally I play his audio, but we're not set up for that. Jared Water is a Republican, an 80 year resident of the Valley. Okay, and he testified this week at the uh, Jackson County Board of Commissioners. I'll summarize what he said. He is a wheat grower, 2,400 acres. He had a wheat uh, crop last year. And who heard about the Oregon wheat scare with GMOs last year? Okay, what happened there? Well, 30 GMO plants from a strain that was supposed to have been destroyed 10 years ago got into a field in Eastern Oregon, all right? And what was the response? Japan and South Korea, customers of our wheat growers, canceled their contracts because their, their standards for food there do not allow genetically engineered wheat in their food system, all right? So, big deal deal, because you know, what Oregon wheat is a half a billion dollar industry, all right? A lot of us, well I got cleared up, but here's a consequence of getting cleared up. Jared hadn't had a chance to pick his, or combine his calls it, his wheat crop. All right, by the time the, the problem got cleared up, it rained in the Rogue Valley and he could not harvest. All right, he testified to the commissioner this Wednesday. He lost a quarter of a million dollars because he, he had to plow that crop under. Okay, this is not about, you know, this is all about the impact on our local farmers. Genetic engineering does not come without, crops do not come without a price. All right. Jared paid the price big time. Chris is gonna use some other examples a little later on. So, we're gonna try and get, cover these points. Why is it a threat? What does the family farmers measure do? Who supports the family farmers measure? And why you should vote for it? So, um, I'm trying to get to where Chris can start. Real quick crash course, okay? Hybridization is intra-species or near-species. Genetic movement, you take tangerines and a palmello, you hybridize them, you get a tangelo. Okay, that's not genetic engineering. That's genetic modification. You know, it's trying to find traits you want, but the genetic engineering involves transgenic or moving DNA between, between different organisms. A bio-red Helios gene gun, looks like Buck Rogers, right? Yeah. You know, okay, well that's, that was a very common technique. They're actually using different techniques now. They put it in a tomato to get a flavor savor tomato. Okay, the result is you get patented intellectual property disguised as food. This is patented material. 
It belongs to the corporation that sells it, and you are under a lot, a lot, a lot of obligations when you get it or get cross-contaminated with it. They're going to have an impact on your farm line. So, um, you know, I have a picture. <laughs> I, I, I put a Photoshop an Aztec warrior with a uh, by a red Hugo machine gun whacking some corn 10,000 years ago to, you know, actually the Aztecs were only about 1,000 years ago. But anyway, the, uh, we, uh, it's not, we haven't been genetically engineering plants for thousands of years. It's a fairly recent phenomenon. Some of the threats, Chris will talk about those in more detail. I just want to do one thing on this history here, I'm with Chris. The Rogue Valley has a 120-year history of quality food. Who ever heard? Okay, everybody know about the 1893 World's Fair in Chicago? Yeah. Big historic event. It put America on the map economically in the world market. Okay, a guy here in Ashton named Max Pratt. In fact, he, he was right down here in Siskiyou, probably right on this campus. This used to be a peach orchard. Okay, he <laughs> developed a peach. Now check this out. One peach. 26 ounces, 16 inches around, the size of a cantaloupe, one peach. He took best to show at the World's Fair in 1893, 120 years ago. Uh, Red Olivier Paris from Harry and David, they've got a 100 year history. And, who, and also in the 1950s, Talent, right up the road, um, had alfalfa, branded Talent, Rogue Valley, original Talent alfalfa seed. Okay, that was the best performing alfalfa in the United States and was that way for a number of years. Now, modern hybridization has caused it to be less, relatively less, less productive. Uh, allegedly, some woman in Grants Pass has a bag of it and they may propagate it for a historical field or something like that. But anyway, 120 year history of quality, uh, quality agriculture here. So. And are non-GMO products, but not organic, a big deal? You betcha. Okay, when General Mills ups, does Cheerios, okay, right here, new no GMOs, okay? Now, modifying Cheerios to be non-GMO wasn't hard, but the fact of the matter is, is getting that label on there is a big deal for General Mills. They know where the money is. Customers want these products. These are other products that are not organic, but they are labeled as non-GMO through the non-GMO project. There's a market for this stuff. People want it. Uh, there's some examples of damages. Uh, there's the wheat scare I talked about. And here's the map. Now Chris gets to take over at the map. And he's going to talk about the impact and why there's an impact. And I'm going to turn it over to him. So. Thank you, everybody. Thank Brian. Um, so, I'm hoping everybody uh, in this room here tonight is this afternoon is aware that more than three quarters of our food supply today, everything we eat is genetically engineered. And I don't say that to scare you. I say that to just let that sink in a little bit. Um, and it continues to move at, a, at a, a growing rate of how much of the food supply is genetically engineered. And the implications of genetic engineering uh, is that a corporation, in this case uh, of the seven who virtually own uh, 85 or so percent of the world's seed supply, are chemical corporations. So it's really important to understand that increasingly as we through consumers and consumer choices every day as we must eat three times per day understand what the ramifications of, uh, of our choices are on a daily basis. Uh, and that is up to us. Each one of us are empowered. We should be empowering each other to uh, make those choices consciously when we go to the grocery store, when we go to a restaurant here in town or anywhere in the Rogue Valley or anywhere in the United States, uh, when, when we make a, fee, a, a, me, a meal for our family, just to understand um, uh, 
the implications of our choices and what we feed those that we love most. Um, so what does it mean to have a genetically engineered food supply? Well, as Brian shared with you earlier, and Ray will uh, spend some time with, um, is that there is a process that you don't do this on the farm. You do this in a laboratory. Um, and uh, virtually that entire amount of that food supply is 90% of that piece of our food supply is engineered to be sprayed heavily with the chemical Roundup, also known as glyphosate. And that is what the engineering uh, has been up to for, I've heard some in the room here uh, having conversations earlier, uh, maybe a couple decades. Well, the re and genetic engineering may be 25 or 30 years, I'm sure Ray will set the record straight on that, but um, what the numbers that I have seen uh, is, or no, the, what the facts are is that from 1996 is about when the first time that corn hit the market genetically engineered to be sprayed with Roundup. Uh, soybeans came right after that sometime in 97 or 98. So we are only talking about maybe a decade or so effectively uh, where a, a growing amount of the food supply has been uh, uh, built on this system that is designed to be sprayed with this pesticide Roundup. And in some cases, um, uh, in probably the case of most of our corn, is, is designed to make its own pesticide. So we've got Roundup and what they call stacking these traits on top of each other. You've got uh, BT ready crops that are making their own pesticides, as we do with uh, some of these trees that they are making these days, the GMO trees, uh, like poplar tree that I believe they're growing someplace here in, in Oregon. Like the corn, any of these crops um, make pesticides 24-7 in their roots, their leaves, their stems, their stalks, their corn, the food that we eat. So, um, and you don't wash that off. So contrary to popular belief that it's, you know, it's just, it's natural because the organic farmers are using it, I would ask, is that true? Is it the same as spraying BT uh, natural chemical or natural uh, uh, organic product microbes? That's these the BT or Bacillus thuringiensis spraying that on a corn and being able to wash that off. Is that the same as it being inside the corn? Um, so. And I'm sure Ray, Ray here is going to share with you later what I'm about to share, but really this ballot measure for us folks here in Jackson County, it's going to come down to how we feel. And that's how we're going to vote in May when this gets put before voters in Jackson County. Um, and, uh, and, and for me, like how I feel about this, it's... It was really troubling on February 23rd of 2012 to be looking for a piece of property and walk onto a piece of land here in Jackson County, here on in Ashland, down on Normal Avenue, and to understand that, uh, that um, the land that we were looking at was being leased by a multinational chemical corporation. Mm -hmm. And Come to find out, within 24 hours doing a little bit more digging, I found out they were banned in their own country. And they were here producing genetically engineered sugar beets. So um, it was troubling most to me, though, to understand that they were right behind the Ashland Middle School. They were right behind the John Muir School and behind the Walker Elementary School, who all happened to be right down on, on uh, uh, right adjacent to uh, I believe it's Walker, Walker Street here in town. So um, that was kind of the wake-up call and other follow-up conversations with Syngenta Corporation themselves come to find out they were planting them across the entire Rogue Valley and they were not going to make those locations public because that runs contrary to uh, their abilities to be able to operate and know that their crops are safe from people who want to destroy these or whatever reason they made up, they said, we cannot tell you that information. 
and uh, and of course at that time some of you may know they were actually it was uh, disallowed to plant them next to any organic farmer or seed producer we after digging deeper into this found out that indeed they were planting them right next to any farm across the Rogue Valley uh, of, of nearly uh, a dozen farms that have come forward saying they were saving seeds um, on the same family as the sugar beets and the, namely the chard and the beet family, the beta vulgaris. Um, and so these farmers were basically left with the decision to spend hundreds of dollars to continue growing their seed crops out or to have their old seed batches tested. Um, putting the burden on our small family farms here in the Rogue Valley has been the process that we've been dealing with now for two plus years. Um, so the ballot measure itself, 6,700 6, signatures were, uh, more than 6,700 six, signatures were gathered to place this measure on the ballot. And uh, since that time, uh, we have continued to grow a list of more than 500 business farmers, nonprofit organizations across the region who stand united with our family farms here in the area. Uh, so that's, that's our reality here in the Rogue Valley. Um, we, we must protect our future. We must protect family farms in the region. We must stand united with our food supply and because uh, that's our future. The farmers you go down every week at the growers market, the people that you see, those faces, uh, shopping cart, uh, food for less, shirts, uh, you know, many other outlets across the area, you can actually purchase these farmers' products. Mm -hmm. It's really important that we show up uh, to support the family farms measure and, uh, and do it in a way that is um, respectful of farmers across the region that may have a difference in opinion, but just getting clear with everybody about the, the potential for uh, pollen contamination. And as you can see with this map, to shift gears here briefly, um, these circles are four mile radius, eight mile diameter. Do the gray outline first. Yeah. So this gray outline here is, is not all of Jackson County. This is actually Bear Creek right here. It's a small small portion of Jackson County. Uh, and these red dots. The, the green dots are the good dots. Yeah, the green dots are the family farms. The red dots are the, the chemical corporation who has been producing their, their genetically engineered crops across the area. And the circle, what happened there? Let's let's see if we can... Give this a little booster shot. And then the circles are four mile radius. Yeah, the circles are four mile radius. And as you can see uh, from the, the, the dark area right up here on top, if I can get this to go, this line right here and this line right here that basically goes right down the middle of the map, those are the mountain peaks. That is peak to peak. And you end up with mostly class three and class four soils for about 75% of this whole entire region. This area right down through Bear Creek, of course this repeats itself up through the upper road and all the way out to Grants Pass and the Applegate areas here. You're not planting your crops up on the mountain peaks. You're planting your crops down in class one soils down on the, bear, on the bottom, the river bottom. And that's where, of course, where most of our farmers are planting their crops too. So there's nothing wrong with that fundamentally, but just to understand that Everybody's got to put their GMOs, put their, uh, their non-GMO crops in here, and so we're trying to figure out how to get along. We had uh, the Southern Oregon Sea Growers Association. We had dozens of farmers across Josephine, Jackson County show up at the Oregon State University Extension Office uh, to work on how to make this system work. It was a neutral uh, party, moderated, uh, facilitated effort to bring our Chem basically the chemical corporation together and all of our farmers in the region on how to quote unquote coexist. And what came out of that, we ended up uh, watching Monsanto, watching Syngenta Corporation walk out of the room after months of these discussions on how we were all going to get along. 
And uh, that did not leave our farmers with much choice at that point. That was uh, uh, almost a year ago when they walked out of that process. It was May 2013, or June 2013 when they walked out. So um, that's, that's the reality. When, when we hear our county commissioners talking about why can't you just coexist and get along? We hear the, the, the state of Oregon, we hear the USDA advising us to just pick up the phone and call Monsanto. Pick up the phone and call Syngenta Corporation. Uh, folks, it doesn't work that way. When our farm had to till under a thousand plus dollar seed contract, after asking Syngenta if they were going to be planting GM sugar beets and them affirming that was the case, it did not leave our farm with much choice other than to, you know, toss, th toss the, you know, just a toss up whether or not our crop was going to be worth nothing or potentially we were going to be able to fulfill our contract and know that we were going to be within the requirements of our contract, which was to have uh, a non GMO seeds. And after talking to our seed buyer, they said we would have to test our seeds to ensure genetic purity of our crop. And that was uh, the likelihood of that was just a toss up again. So instead of us carrying on to grow those crops for months on to do all the process of seeing them through to their completion, we made the decision to till under, uh, till under our crop up, up here somewhere outside of uh, town in Ashland. Um, we have the Ron Bjork, uh, the president of the Jackson County Farm Bureau, who has stated, is there a risk of genetically modified alfalfa cross-pollinating with conventional alfalfa? Alfalfa is a really big crop here in southern Oregon, Klamath Falls, Jackson, Josephine, Bend area. Ron Bjork affirmatively said, absolutely. But he is the director of the political arm of the Farm Bureau. This is our yeah. opposition. Making that statement. Will it cross contaminate? Absolutely. Yeah. All right. Yeah. So, um, if Fry Family Farm, every year for the past two years since this issue was brought to light, has had to till under their crops. They've been trying to coexist again to get along with Syngenta. Syngenta plants them across the street from them. They have no other choice than to till under. Or, uh, or, or risk other financial uh, investments not knowing if their seed crop is worth nothing. Uh, Chuck Burr had to till under nearly $5,000 worth of seeds uh, to protect his markets with that would, that restoration would seed company. His property tax bill for the year. His, uh, Brian says his property taxes would have been paid with that uh, amount. Abbey Lane Farm and other farms across the region um, of, of the 160 plus farms that we have signed on in support of the measure, I, actually, I, I sh should say, I believe the number is like 140, is that what, where we're at, rough, roughly, Brian? 140 farms signed on to our measure, and uh, a few dozen more over in Josephine County are also in support of removing genetically engineered crops from, uh, from the Rogue Valley. How many people in the audience have a garden to save their own seeds? More than a few, right? Okay, well, you too. <laughs> you want to grow seeds free from your intellectual corporate property disguised as food, maybe we want to consider voting yes to this initiative. Yeah. Yeah. And uh, so in the past few years, uh, the USDA has been actually tracking uh, the usage of pesticides and glyphosate. Over the past 15 years, nearly, uh, 159 million pound increase uh, in the use of, of the applications of glyphosate. This has been vetted or uh, affirmed by a Washington State University study uh, done by Charles Benbrook. Um, and the next slide is does the why that's important. Oh, well, I was just saying the next slide. He was, you know, the first slide about extra pesticides is important in the context of this slide. Right. Yeah. And so uh, we have the American Pediatrics Association um, who are saying that essentially increased herbicide use and risk, risks in our drinking water are going to affect our children and our future. Um, exposure. Uh, farmers to patent infringement and litigation is a reality. 
a uh, farmer here in Indiana uh, uh, has spoken out about this. Many other farmers across the country have spoken out about this. There are 100, um, there are 20, at least 2,500 cases reported according to the Center for Food Safety where Monsanto has litigated farmers across the United States for patent infringement on seed ownership. Um, so so our, our, our family farms, the, the family farms measure 15119 uh, is simple. Prohibit, prohibition, the county is basically, we, we cannot grow this stuff. You get, have 12 months to get rid of it if you are growing it. Okay. Take over. Okay. All right. You're on it, Brian. You're in. Okay. Mm -hmm. Okay. Mm -hmm. uh, one, thing that, okay. Um, one of the things that uh, our, our opposite says, oh, you go down to uh, Home Depot and get some GMO seeds, take them home, you violated the law. That's nonsense. You cannot get genetically engineered seeds without signing a contract with Monsanto. You can go down to Helena Chemical on 1st Street in uh, Medford, or d and Seeds a little farther down Highway 99. Walk in there and say, hey, I want a bag of GMO corn. And I say, well, you got to register as a grower with Monsanto. After, you, after they clear you as a qualified grower, they'll send you a contract to sign, okay? Now, you won't see all the contract. You'll get a bag of corn that has a little shrink wrap on the side. By opening this bag, you can send to all the terms and conditions of your technical use agreement, a TUA, all right? Um, those TUAs are somewhat burdensome. One of the things you do by opening the bag is you give Monsanto or Syngenta non-expiring rights to enter your property and examine your financial records, including your tax records, the whole enchilada, and it's for a lifetime. It doesn't expire a year later when you don't want to deal with them anymore. You give those rights up by opening that bag, okay? You sign a non-disclosure agreement. It says, if you don't like this stuff, you can't talk about it. If you do, we'll come sue you. You give that up, your freedom of speech, okay? Um, and uh, you don't like any of this stuff, sue us in the state of Missouri. Can't do it here. But, and there's a whole lot of other things, too, that are wrong with it as well. There's a website called faircontracts.org. You can do that and look for a typical GMO contract, and it's quite burdensome. A lot of farmers open it, don't know, but this is down to the legal things. Monsanto will say, well, gosh, you know, we've only sued 140 people in 20 years. What's that, seven cases a year? That's not a lot, given all the farms there are. And here's the deal. <laughs> Monsanto only goes to court when it's a slam dunk and they know they're gonna win. All right, what they do before then is they quote, let's settle up here. Okay, there's a report out there from, uh, I think it's Center for Food Safety, uh, or else, yeah, UCS. Center for Food Safety has a report called Seed Giants. Look it up, okay? In the last five years, there have been over 5,000 settlements for $183 million from farms, okay? And they're all under non-disclosure. Just be quiet, pay us the money buy your seeds and everything will be okay. It's, it's, it's corporate bullying big time. So this is a, what this side's about in terms of, it's, this is a real nasty mess for farmers who fall into the trap. Okay, so we talked about what it does, all right? So we passed, we did a simple ordinance. How does law get written? Um, well, we took sort of the best of the bunch. Morin County has a ban. The definitions they use, we borrowed, in effect. I get, that goes back to my thing about recombinant DNA techniques, okay? That's genetic engineering. Goosing marijuana with crocus juice is not, okay? But unfortunately, that's all you're going to hear about, okay, and this, and, you know, from the opposition. What? You smoke medical marijuana? Man, don't vote for that thing because you won't be able to. It's a lie. It's a crock. It's bull, okay? What is it? Okay, what else is it? It's using existing county law. There's a pair ordinance. Jackson County has a 21-year-old law called the pair, it's a pair ordinance. It protects pear orchards here from their neighbor's farm that has been abandoned. And if the abandoned pear orchard is a threat to the existing pear orchards, then there's a whole series of county law procedures to be followed. Guess what? We copied that word for word. <laughs> Okay? It's existing law. It doesn't add any new bureaucracy. 
Nothing in the ordinance says you got to hire people. Okay? Nothing says you got to enforce it. Now, we'd like it to be, but uh, there's no mandate for additional expenditures. And then also, the reasonable and the reasonableness of the pear orchard, well, first, there's not a lot of bad pear orchards compared to GMO plots, so that's a little bit of a difference there. But the fact of the matter is the county, for financial reasons, has shown weak enforcement or abatement procedures for uh, the pair ordinance. Well, anyway, our law is the same thing. They can do. They if they choose to. They can do it. Um, and, and the county has enforcement discretion. And, and also, now the backup as citizens who feel wronged by it have a right to enforce the law as well. The wording in the law. Go look it up. You can do it on the Jackson County website. You can do it on our farm family farms website. It says private persons or groups of persons and the county have the authority to enforce this law. It doesn't say must, it says has the authority to. But of course the opposition is trying to paint us in a corner saying we're just trying to steal from uh, county resources. Again, it's bull, so. It has an exemption for medical and scientific research in closed labs. We're not anti-science. We hear that a lot. You guys are anti-science. All right, well look, if, if Oregon uh, OSU Extension or a pharmaceutical genetic engineering firm wants to open up a laboratory here, they can do it. There's an exemption for that. It's the only requirement is what they do is done in a closed facility so their pollen doesn't drift on the farms. Now, we heard that, oh God, we have to like, put a dome over a field. Well, like, there are standards in the federal government for biocontainment. They were several levels you can choose as appropriate, but it's not this like massive, you know, dome over some field somewhere. It's really reasonableness uh, will prevail. It has a 12-month grace period. You know, if you plan it this year and the law passes, what are you going to do? Rip it out? No, you get to wait a year, harvest your crop, sell it, and move on to something else next year. We're trying. We're trying not to punish people for the past, we want a reasonable transition. A year's good enough. Okay, so this goes back to who supports it. Um, Chris kind of talked about that. Where's that white, big white foam board thing? This is a, this is a, so let me grab that and bring it up here. This is a great speaker's prop. Okay. This is our support list on a piece of foam board. It's not a short list. Okay, folks. Okay, 150 restaurants, I mean 150 farms have signed this locally, five granges, okay, over 100 restaurants and 200 other businesses signed this thing. It's a, and it's broad and deep community support. Now I'm not suggesting you go there, but the opposition, what do they have for support? <laughs> Out of staters, okay, the sugar industry. I got a slide at the bottom here. Let me, let me scroll forward real fast. Uh, there, okay. Our opposition takes money from out-of-state sugar companies, $175,000, $21,000 from out-of-state farm bureaus like Texas, South Dakota, and Colorado. Other county farm bureaus in Oregon, Clackamas, Multnomah, Deschutes, gave $45,000, and Monsanto and Syngenta give Oregon Farm Bureau Political Action Committee 25% of their budget, and they've given $26,000 to fight this. And the Jackson County Farm Bureau has managed to pony up five grand, but local citizens here, look at that number. Less than 1% of our opposition's money comes from inside the county. All right, that's what's going on here. And uh, by the way, this is my Aztec guy with a buyer rag gun, so. Uh, so that's the support that's here. Do you want to cover it before I move on to the economic benefits? Your choice. Okay, all right, so why, what's the positive side of this? Okay, um, Marin County passed a ban eight year, 10 years ago almost, and uh, so in 2004, I got a dot here, 2004, their economy was $55 million. Eight years later, 2012, it was $80 million, so about 146, 46% 46 growth, it's an index, 100 up to 146. Now, Marin County breaks out organic production. Uh, it's, it's not very many counties do that from a reporting procedure. They were 3.6 million, pretty small, but eight years later, they were seven times bigger. 
Right, and the number of farms went from 34 to 84. And why is that? It's, it's Kevin Costner's Field of Dreams. You build it and they will come. All right. Uh, farmers know they do not have to bear the cost of coexistence in Marion County. They flock there. Okay, so on an index value, the blue line is total value, number of organic farms up to 200%, and the value of that produce, 700%. Okay, so, and it's not just Marin County. Let's look at Santa Cruz. They passed a ban in 2006, which is right, whoops, right. What did I just do? Oh well, someone else did that. <laughs> okay, 2006, they were around 400 something. Now they're up to 566. Now it's a 40% growth, it's a bit. Now there's no breakout there. And of course, what made it grow? I can't get into the details. But the fact of the matter is, was with the Jamel Low Crop Band in place, all right, it wasn't a collapse of the Santa Cruz economy. That's $566 million. That's seven times bigger than Jackson County is in a fraction of the footprint. Santa Cruz County is the smallest county in California next to the county of San Francisco. Okay, it's a, you know, it does not hurt their local economy. So, uh, there's a whole lot of other concerns we can talk about, so uh, we can go over some of these if you want, but the idea is here is, uh, what's your vision for the future of Jackson County? Air and water, good quality, is that what you want? Uh, how about crop land? There's short-term glyphosate use. Ten years later, that's what the ground looks like. How about forests? Who likes to take a walk in the woods here? Everybody likes that. Ever seen a GMO forest? Okay, now, that's, that's GMO monoculture. Anybody who hasn't seen the film Silent Forest by Dr. Suzuki, I recommend you do it. You run out and get all your friends to vote yes, okay? Most of Jackson County is trees. You know what the pollination distance on all conifers is? 100 miles. Okay, so you put a private plot in the middle of the Siskiyou National Monument, and there's, there's private plots there, and you can do what you want in that private land. All right, you start putting that out there, and that starts cross-pollinating your natural wilderness. Okay, that's, is that, is that your future? Not mine. So I recommend that you sign a supporter sheet right now. Donate to our cause. Help us spread the word. And I think that's it. You got more, Chris? Well, we're going to take questions now, or uh, I think it might be appropriate to take questions now, and then don't you come up? No, please take questions. Okay, so let's do, uh, Wendell got one. Are there actual farmers who are small family farmers uh, in Jackson County who plant GMOs, or, or is that a contract deal, you know, is somebody just renting the land and somebody else plants? How does yes. that work? Um, I have personally talked to dozens of farmers, probably in excess of 200, maybe 250 farmers across the region in the past two years about this. I know at this moment of two farmers in their area that grow GMOs and one, uh, another who is done with genetic engineering crops and getting out of it. So who, the, who, how does it get, is it, if it's not the farmers doing it, is it like they contract it out? So, this, so Syngenta, the Multinational Chemical Corporation, uh, actually leases land from landowners across the region, growing these GE sugar beets on quarter acre, half acre, one acre, four acre plots out across the Rogue Valley. They, those landowners have virtually no involvement. Uh, they may water, they may do some other menial things, but in the whole scope of things, that's probably worked in, into their lease cost, which, by the way, doesn't uh, really, um, uh, is about what I would pay for a piece of land as a farmer here in Jackson County. It's about the same rate as any farmer in Jackson or Josephine or Southern Oregon pay to lease a piece of land. That's what the multinational who is here planting these GE crops is paying for their land while they contaminate our farmers while they export their seeds out of Jackson County. Let's, yeah, let's get a little, a little example here. Okay, let's just for the sake of argument, Suggest that there's 50 contract GMO sugar beet plots in their area. That's in the ballpark, okay? 
And the cost of an acre of agricultural land here to rent is about well, between three and five hundred a year, depending on the water and stuff like that. So 50 plots, 500 a year, okay, that contributes $25,000 to our local economy. And all that product's taken out of here and sold somewhere else. It gives some contract laborers five or six weeks of employment. Most of them are bussed in from other places. They're day laborers, a variety of sources, okay. So it's not a big contribution to our economy, all right. Jackson County's economy is $79 million for agricultural products. Of that, $15 million is direct sales to consumers. That's farmers markets and, and, and farm stands and things like that. Now, if you look at the Marin County experience, and they got a seven-fold increase in that value. Let's just say we double our agricultural output in the short term uh, because we have a GMO crop ban. That takes $13 million up to $26 million. How does that compare to $25,000 contribution to our economy? It's where the money is, folks. Vote yes. Yeah. All right. Um, next question. Here. Um, I'm a bit ignorant in this area, but um, is uh, contamination restricted to, uh, let's say, if you had a GMO alfalfa and more, and just natural alfalfa? Could that GMO alfalfa contaminate other um, vegetation besides that natural um, alfalfa? The highest risk, of course, is a, a, there's an organic seed grower. Organic alfalfa seed grower, they're the highest risk from out, or, or, or GMO alfalfa seed growers. That's the <laughs> highest risk. Okay. Uh, organic milk depends upon uh, organic alfalfa. It's important, not only, but it's an important part of the feed mix. But they, these GMO crops do have trans, uh, you know, trans, what's the word I'm looking for? Maybe Ray can help me. Okay. Sugar beet seeds will pollinate beet and chards. Okay. Uh, uh, canola up in the Willamette affects the whole brassica family, kale, broccoli. Is cabbage a brassica? Cabbage, yes. radishes, okay. uh, turnips, rutabagas. So just planting one has, 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 can spread across other varieties in the same you know, I, genus or species. I don't know. I'm, 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 my taxonomy is not the best. Species. In the same species. In the same species, there'll, there'll be some drift there. Okay, now you hear, well, gee, doesn't your organic stuff contaminate the GMO grower? <laughs> well, I mean, that's, that's a valid question. But the fact of the matter is, there's no economic impact to the GMO grower who sells his stuff, whereas the reverse is, is not true. All right. If Syngenta was worried about their GMO crop, would they be planting so close to everybody else? Ask yourself that. Common sense tells you they don't care. That's the, and they don't care what happens to the grass either. That, that's a vitally important piece to understand is to go back to that map. And the map, by the way, is back there. There are two of these maps to just sit down and look and study those maps and understand uh, that that's the way it has been for two and a half, you know, going on two and a half, three years, at least, possibly four years, these guys have been doing this. So do they really care that they're getting pollens from other farmers? And, and, if, and if so, like what's the chance that they just till under their crop? Like it's, it's economically it's different. Our smaller farmers are taking a big hit when they have to till under that thousand, two thousand, five thousand dollars crop as we've seen Fry Family Farm and Restoration Seed Company. Uh, you know, that that's like a pretty good chunk of doing business. Whereas a multi-billion dollar corporation, uh, 12 billion to be exact with the case of Syngenta, you know, how big how big of a hit is it to till under one field out of their dozens that they have across the road valley? I just want to clarify one number that you gave. The total the total value of, of agricultural products in the valley for $79 million, is that what you said? That's, that's what the USDA reported in a two, actually, Oregon State University an economist, Mallory Leahy, that was based on 2007 data. That's the last available. Okay, and 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 15 million were direct sales. Uh, actually, 13.5, I think. Okay, 13. 13.5. I believe that's the number. I could, you know, plus or minus. Now, if if that's the case, where does the uh, organic farm 
fit into that. Okay, there's, there's no, unfortunately there's no breakout. I, 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 believe me, we looked hard for it. Yeah. But I can call the economist that did it, and there's no breakout. And so the, the worst part is, you know, there's no, especially no breakout on GMO versus non-GMO. You have to understand that not everybody is a certified organic farmer. Uh, we talked to Oregon's Extension, uh, Maude Powell and Phil Van Busker, and we said, well, just how many farms are there here? And their estimate, we got us in writing, there's about 150 commercial farms in the area. Of those, 50 are certified organic. The remaining 100, now whether they're GMO or trying, just doing a non-certified but using organic methods, there's no way to there's no way to squeeze those that granularity out. I will say this: you may hear that. Well, we've all been told this. Why there's 2,000 farms in Jackson County? and only 30 of them are organic, 95% of our farms are going to have to go out of business. Well, let me tell you what that 2,000 number is. Okay, there's only 120 farms in this area that report more than $50,000 a year in total farm sales. Okay, if you take it down to $20,000, a poverty level for a family of four, there's 250 farms reported at that. Half the 2,000 farms report less than $1,000 a year in income. Now, I, I would say that might, might be a hobby farm, but it doesn't really, it's not a commercial farm if you're only doing $1,000 a year in business. So it's important, you're gonna, you're, again, it's all, you're all, you, you get half the data from a propagandist, so. Thank you very much. Yeah. 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 All right. Uh, so that's uh, let's bring Ray on up here and uh, uh, get to the bottom of uh, the science here. Thank you. science either, by the way. <laughs> Where I like to say I'm coming from is something that I read a oh, month, month and a half ago that just caught me and influences me again tonight. And it's an editorial, an op-ed so-called in the New York Times written by uh, Michael Mann, who is a climatologist at Pennsylvania State University. And I, as I recall, the title of his uh, article was, If You See Something, Say Something. And that's what I'm all about tonight. Uh, that uh, opinion in the New York Times, written by a professor, written by a scientist, was actually directed at other scientists. A little bit kind of different philosophy uh, in terms of an op-ed in, in the New York Times. And it just struck me. It came home. Listen, I, I'm so lucky to live in this valley. It's kind of my second retirement location. Uh, I'm even more lucky to live on five acres right across the freeway. And I've wondered for the three and a half, four years I've been here, what the heck I'm going to do with that four acres. And put your head or get inside my head on what I'm about to say. What I learned tonight and what I hope you've learned. Gee, maybe I can plant some Christmas trees, no, maybe that's too long a time frame, so I'll buy some little ornamental dug fir trees and try to resell them in a couple of years. And somebody's going to bring them home and they'll be cross-pollinated with a GMO forest of dug fir trees? No, I don't want to do that. I know, my sister has some horses and she's thinking organic, so why don't I plant some alfalfa on my four acres and I haven't used pesticide on it and maybe I'll grow it for seed. Can't do that. Don't want to do that. Oh, I know. My neighbors have grapes on their three and four acres. By God, that's what I'll do because we don't know about any genetically engineered grapes at this moment. And we wouldn't have to worry about cross-pollination, but I'm going to tell you, 
in a little while, what we have to worry about is we're going to come back to reusing 2,4-D like we've never seen before is a concern that I have. And why is that a concern with grapes? Because grapes are about the most sensitive plant that we have in our commercial repertoire in terms of its sensitivity to 2,4-D. In fact, it's taken the grape industry, the edible grape industry, to non-existence in the Midwest several decades ago. So, coupled with the reports of up to a 100-mile fog drift of 2,4-D, oh, my neighbors are in trouble, so I don't want to plant, plant grapes. What am I going to do with that land? I don't know. <laughs> okay, that was on a personal note. Listen, I want to try to make tonight all about education. And one of the reasons why I'm kind of motivated, driven about that is the eyes are upon us, folks. Eyes from all distances. And we want to do this thing right that's coming up in May. And by doing it right, how do we do that? Well, it's a matter of education. Learning everything from the science to the real world nitty gritty practicalities that you just heard from Chris and Brian. So now that you know the nitty gritty local real world practical issues, I'm going to try to tell you what's going on in the world, what's going on in the United States, and a little bit about what's going on in other areas in Oregon. So quickly, let's get started. Okay, so after a brief introduction, I'm going to tell you why we don't label things that we eat and how that goes about, and why it happens. Uh, just a slide or two about who's regulating this stuff and how it happens. Uh, I really have a hang up on crop yields. And I figure if our farmers aren't making more money off of increased yields, why in the world are they using this technology? I don't get it. What's in it for costs, for our farmers, for us as consumers, and then round up in our environment and some non-target effects that are happening uh, out in our country. Resistant weeds, so what? And recently we've heard about the unregulated release of a Roundup-resistant grass that I think is problematic for us. And I hope to tell you why. So we'll start with promises uh, that came <coughs> to the public in the 80s and 90s about the technology that said, wow, increased crop yields make more money, decrease use of pesticides, and certainly convenience of our farming practices. <laughs> so folks, we're talking about a, a process, as I, Chris and Brian said, happens in a laboratory, not out in the field, that merges a few genes. Not cross-pollination that will merge, say, 10, G, uh, 10 chromosomes, 20,000 genes, but a few, one, two, three genes from very distant, distantly related organisms that creates novel, unique, different, one-of-a-kind, patentable products. Don't occur naturally, sorry, and this is not traditional crossbreeding, Sorry, I'll take that home to the bank. <laughs> this is not exactly how it works, and because I want to tell you some other things later on, I'm really going to cut short how we make these things. And let's see if this works. First, there is a gun involved. It doesn't shoot a fish, but it shoots DNA. Literally, there are bullets in this gun. You can't see them. They're microscopic size. You have to look under the microscope. And what you could do, if you, if you looked real closely, you would see some little droplets of gold particles to which there's all kinds of DNA sticking to it. And these bullets are shot into individual plant cells, carries the DNA with it, say, for bacteria. Some of that DNA gets incorporated, integrated, becomes a part of the genetic material of a corn plant or a soybean plant or a cotton plant, be that as it may. And this is kind of what I'm trying to talk about. First, uh, let's make a, a, a Roundup Ready corn plant that produces a toxin from a bacteria. So we need two bacteria. And we're going to take a gene out of this one, and we're going to take one gene out of this one. 
So very few numbers of genes. Two different types of bacteria. One of those genes allows that organism to produce a toxin that kills insects. And the other gene allows that uh, trait to resist the application of a chemical roundup. We also add a gene from a virus, a plant virus, into a test tube situation. We bring them all back together. So we have two genes from bacteria, one from a virus. We combine them all together in a test tube in the laboratory. And as I showed you a moment ago, that's what gets shot into blood plant tissue. And the result is we can grow out from a single cell an entire corn plant after we shoot them up. And that corn plant becomes then resistant to Roundup when we can spray it to kill the weeds. We don't have to worry about killing our corn. And we don't have to worry about adding extra pesticides to kill the, the moths or the worms that get after the corn because every single cell in that plant now is making the pesticide. And as Chris and Brian said, you can't wash it away, right? It's part of the genetic makeup of that plant. And it gets harvested, of course, and it gets into our food chain. So at the stage after we shoot an individual cell, we uh, carry out a patentable process in which we add some hormones, and that one single plant cell regenerates an entire corn plant. And here I want to show you as an example on a nutritive medium. We are regenerating some baby plants. I call them plantlets. And uh, they're kind of not doing well on this side, and they're looking really good on the right side because we've splayed, sprayed that plate, as an example, with some Roundup. So the little plantlets that never receive the gene from the bacterium that says, now you're resistant to Roundup. We don't want those. So they'll die off. The ones that survive at this stage, we're interested in, we'll look at them further because we know they've at least received the Roundup resistant gene. Those can be planted into soil and then subjected to further tests. And of course they are. Industry looks at, is the toxin gene being produced? What do these plants look like when they mature? How is their yield? Do they behave and look and act and yield? more or less like we wanted. So they look at real world, practical consequences of the laboratory genetic manipulation. Okay? So this is then how we would make a genetically engineered, in this case, corn plant that resists Roundup, spray, and resists uh, chewing away, uh, if you will, uh, by insects because they'll, the insects will die after exposure and ingestion of the toxin. So from bacteria, we take the genes, we incorporate or we need a virus to act as kind of the orchestra leader to make sure those genes function and they function strongly and loudly. So that's how we make them. And I want to make a special point. I didn't say anything about yield enhancing genes, nor did I say anything about drought survival genes. We just added a toxin gene, and we added a Roundup resistant gene. And there is nothing novel, unique to allow us or make us expect that this corn plant is going to produce more than the non-genetically engineered corn plant. Why should it? Why? Why should it make a higher yield per acre? I don't know. There is no reason. It, the process depends upon the presence of insects that are susceptible to the toxin. Otherwise, that crop is going to be infested if those insects are resistant. The technology depends also upon killing of weeds that are sensitive to Roundup. If Roundup resistant weeds come, it's going to detract from the yield of this genetically engineered corn. Understand that concept? 
In other words, if that product goes into a field, the genetically engineered product, where there are weeds that are resistant to Roundup, it's the, pro the product is not going to work right. If it goes into a field where there are pest insects that are resistant to the toxin, the insects are still going to eat the plant. So it depends upon external factors to be successful. Understand that? Mm -hmm. Unfortunately, what's happened in the last 17 years, by the by, is that farmers are having one hell of a time now with Roundup-resistant weeds. Yeah. And it's detracting from, away, from their yields. There are also at least five species of toxin-resistant insects that have been naturally selected for in the United States. So in those areas, this kind of a product is a failure. The farmers can't get any benefit from paying for these things because it's not going to work because you've got weed problems. You can't spray with Roundup. You've got to use something else. Well, your crop isn't resistant to something else. Yeah. Okay. What foods then are produced from genetically engineered crops? And I think that was discussed earlier. Let's just go on. I want to make a special point. We all buy vegetable oil because it's all 100% natural. Well, it's all 100% made from genetically engineered crops. Canola oil, corn oil, and some of it's olive oil that's been mixed with corn oil. I'm not saying that the genetically engineered genes or the gene products are in the oil. No, probably not. But I'm saying it's been derived from that management technology. Where else do we find it? Most of our snack foods. Uh, soy is, I call it, uh, kind of a filler food. It's high protein and it gets put into hot dogs, etc. Of course, tofu and uh, edamame and corn and grits and cornmeal and taco shells and of course our cereals but the best for last where the bulk of it goes and you know we consume on average about 190 pounds of genetically engineered foods per year where do we get all of that from from here approximately a magnitude of 70 percent of the genetically engineered corn that is produced in the United States goes here. Yeah. Let's talk briefly about labeling. Uh, labeling as genetically engineered, or this food contains uh, material derived from genetically engineered organisms in this country is voluntary. And there are places, there are stores locally here in town where you can go and you see a label. Anything that's organic is very likely to be free of genetically engineered material. No guarantees anymore, but very likely to be free. And usually in the co-op and places like that, uh, without mentioning other, without doing an advertisement here for other stores, uh, uh, you'll find labels. What is the rule for labeling? And let me know if this goes off the screen and you, and you don't understand what it's saying. Here. <laughs> There's a rule uh, called the Federal Food, Drug, and Cosmetic Act of 1992 that the Food and Drug Administration adheres to, and they say, two foods must be significantly different in a material way in order to be labeled one from the other. I mean to say, if they look different, they taste different, or they smell different, or their texture is different, they need to be labeled. I need to tell you what has been done with this to make it smell different, what has been done with this to make it look different, and so on. And that's the rule. And let's apply that rule. Here we have <coughs> non-genetically engineered Atlantic salmon freshly caught. Take a look at the color. Some of that Atlantic salmon or uh, steelhead uh, gets raised on farms, it's non-genetically engineered, 
and you will see on the label uh, color added, color added in the food or something like that because I hope you can see the difference between the farm raised, color changed, and the wild naturally caught. What I'm trying to tell you is if you go to the local box store and buy, in this case, steelhead, that's fresh farm, you will see color added through feed. That's your label. However, if we get approval, and it could happen any day, of a genetically engineered Atlantic salmon, the same species I just showed you on the previous slide, but it's genetically engineered, and oh my gosh, it's genetically engineered to be a size difference. By the way, exaggerated here, these fish are not the same age. Uh, if they are the same age, the genetically engineered one is maybe double, or more or less, the size of the non-genetically engineered. It's, they put in genes from two other fish to make it grow more rapidly. And the bottom line, what I'm trying to say is, very unlikely that it's going to be voluntarily labeled as genetically engineered, even though you might be able to see a size difference. See with the senses. It will differ in size. Unlikely it's going to be labeled. Another example could happen any day, the approval of an apple called uh, uh, Arctic, Arctic apple. And it has a completely different kind of a molecular biological process involved in producing it than I showed you in the corn. But it suppresses uh, the browning reaction. It inactivates uh, a key component in the meat of that apple, causes the browning. You can see a difference. This is the genetically engineered apple. It's pretty white. This is the ungenetically engineered apple here, and it's brown. You see a difference. Uh, what if you walked into a store and they had a display and they wanted you to sample this special new kind of apple? Which one of these two, and I hope you can see it with the lighting, which one of these would you choose? The browning one or the white one? Well, they're not going to have to tell you that the white one is genetically engineered. Even though you would, I think, be tempted to take the white one. So are you confused about the labeling rule? Because I am. I honestly, truthfully am confused as to why we would need to label uh, an Atlantic salmon that has color added in its food and a genetically engineered Atlantic salmon that looks different in size. We don't label. <laughs> I don't get it. What do you think is the reason there? Well, I can tell you that if that genetically engineered hyped up salmon or the Arctic apple was sold in any one of these countries, it would be labeled as derived from genetically engineered material. You want to go to Vietnam to find it? <laughs> How about Peru? Planning a summer vacation to Russia? You'll see it labeled there. Not here. And part of the riddle to this is when we ship our genetically engineered corn, as an example, from Brownsville in Ohio, from a farm there to Russia, it'll be labeled genetically engineered. However, if that corn was put into taco shells and delivered to Ashland from the same state, the same town, and God knows, maybe even from the same ranch or farm, it won't be late. Is that frustrating? Is that confusing? Tell me. Okay. I want to talk very briefly about regulation. I don't like to talk about that because being a scientist, uh, it just doesn't do much for me so quickly. Uh, let me acknowledge that the next couple of slides were obtained from a young lady who is an attorney. Her name is Melissa Wisherath. Uh, she's one of the illegal beagles involved in Oregon's uh, coming on November ballot labeling initiative. And I would suggest you go to her website, sustainabilitylaw.info. She's stationed in Eugene. Fine young lady. Uh, and she's loaned me these slides. 
So the USDA uh, APHIS Animal Plant uh, oh my God, uh, Health Inspection Service uses the Plant Protection Act. The EPA has three acts, one of which again is the Food and Drug Cosmetic Act, and FDA has one act that Congress tells them to go to work on. And I think I'll just show you for time constraints about USDA APHIS. They regulate and ask the question if the organism has been altered and produced through genetic engineering, they can regulate it, but it must also be a plant pest. And that's why we see so many approvals being made because the industry now does not use any genes that could be derived from a plant pest and making the new generations of genetically engineered crops to come. And ladies and gentlemen, I will tell you how many are or ask how many are coming? Ten? No. A hundred? Sorry, no. How many are in the pipeline? Thousands of new genetically engineered foods. Fruits, vegetables, modification of current crops. Thousands are in the pipeline. Get ready, they're coming. What the world is that going to do to the nations or to the world's natural gene pool? Okay, let's skip ahead and I want to make a big deal out of this slide. Patent. We know that all of these products are patented and in 1995 a new law gave them 20 years uh, to run on a patent. Uh, Brian talked about patent infringement cases. My number is too low, but my point here is I want to make sure you know that patents on, say, a soybean variety grants exclusive rights to the patent holder. Duh, okay. Does not allow any innocent infringements. In other words, if they wanted to, as Brian pointed out, they have in 5,000 cases. If you have been contaminated through cross-pollination and you get a visit from Monsanto or Syngenta on your farm, which you have to agree to, to allow them when you sign your contract, you are liable for a lawsuit because you had infringed, you had infringed on a patent, even if it's an innocent problem. Does it matter? Uh, this is a fancy legal term for the amount of contamination. Doesn't matter. And finally, that patent says you do not have, or it grants the holder the right to prevent anyone from studying, testing, or examining the genetic material in that patented plant material. So time and time again, I get asked, I get emails, Ray, why don't we know about bop, 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 bop? And the answer is right here. The right to prevent anyone from studying, testing, or examining a gene. Most scientists don't want to wind up either in the jail or being fined. Is that clear? Understand. Uh, last night I was left, I left the meeting uh, a little bit frustrated. Uh, who was there at the event last night? Okay. I never did get my, my question answered, so I worked on my question myself this morning and figured something out. Uh, last night's speaker uh, quoted a paper uh, from Clive James. Uh, the material was published in the International Service for the Acquisition of Agrobiotech Applications. It's, I call it, I call it, kind of a, a front publicity magazine for the industry. It's non-peer-reviewed material. Just that one person writes up an article. Okay. And in that uh, article, it says more than 90% of the farmers using GMOs are now in, in uh, I'm sorry, developing nations. Remember that. I say this is where the agronomic capabilities are very poor. Agricultural practices are little understood. And any type of agronomic help that may be provided by a seed producer could go a long ways in boosting the production. Fair enough? 
Okay. That article said there were 47 million tons, tons of world food gain in production due to genetically engineered crops in one year. God, that's a big number. Why isn't everyone using genetically engineered crops? Okay, from the information in that article, uh, this 47 million tons came from 385 million acres. If you crunch the numbers here, that shows an increase of about 250 pounds per acre using genetic engineered crops on average. So in a third world country, if your corn produ production is maybe 1,000 pounds an acre, that could represent a 25% increase if somebody taught you how to farm. That is big time substantial. Understand that. The yields per acre in the United States are of the order of eight to 10,000 pounds per acre. So a 250 pound per acre increase is not going to make or break a farmer, but let's continue with these numbers. There isn't a farmer around that wouldn't want to have 250 pounds more. There's a little problem, though, with the data. And this is my hang-up. Where's the control? Do you see any evidence on this slide, or did I tell you and forget that there was no increase in production at all when you used a non-genetically engineered plant? In other words, say the farmers in Bangladesh that were taught, you know, you don't have to limit yourself to 1,000 seeds per acre. You can put in 2,000 seeds per acre. Don't use the fertilizer from your cow. Buy some fertilizer at the store. Well, we'll help you. Uh, got any water around here to water your crop? That's going to increase your yield, and etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. In my mind, this is what's going on. So if the initial bar is low, and they're only used to getting 1,000 pounds per acre, any little change in their agronomic uh, practice could really kick things up. Understand what I'm saying? Mm -hmm. And I like to ask the question, if you did the same change with non-genetically engineered seeds, what would your increase be? That, inform that information is not there. Yeah. That's my only point. No control. There's no control. OK, let's bring it to the United States. I have to show you something that appeared in a press release last month, February 2014, four weeks ago, from the United States Department of Agriculture. Economic Research Service of the USDA, they do all of the statistical work. And they said, over the first 15 years of commercial use, GMO seeds have not been shown to definitively increase yields. Got that? U.S. Department of Agriculture. And in fact, the yields occasionally are lower than the yields of conventional varieties. Wow. Is that what we heard last night? I didn't think so either. Thank you. <laughs> okay. For those of you that like numbers, let's take a look in more detail. This is really important. <laughs> Right? I mean, if they're not producing more crop for our farmers, why? Why are we using this? Okay. Let's go to Ohio and data published by Ohio State University Extension Service about a contest, a corn growing contest that's very big and popular among Ohio farmers. Two years of data. And there were a total of 19 varieties of corn. Hundreds of farmers participated. And of those 19 varieties, only three were non-genetically engineered. Only three because they all knew that you can be better off with GMO crops. Right? Yeah. Okay. Let's look at the results. 
The average corn yield was 219 bushels. And to put that into perspective, you know what the national average is? About 160. So do these farmers know how to grow corn in Ohio? You better believe it. Really over the average. The non-GMO average was 221. <laughs> Whoops. Whoops. GMO average, 219. Bottom line, no mathematical difference in the yields. But let me throw in a little bit more data and say, or show you, in six cases, the genetically modified organism yields were greater than the non-GMO. Six varieties did better. What about the other 13? Or the other 10, I'm sorry. Oh, they were less. Bottom line, no mathematical difference. Quickly, uh, those of you that like to look at graphs, uh, this is corn yield, and it increases every year. This is the date. The data is from the U.S. Department of Agriculture, averages for the whole United States. This is the yield that increase, increase, increase every year due to technology. Primarily developments in cross-hybridization. Primarily. The red portion of this graph is for the pre-GMO. The green is post-GMO. And there's no mathematical differences in the slope of the green and the red portions of the line. Meaning that we still increased yields year to year to year, but the rate of increase didn't change. GMO, non-GMO. Okay, so at this point, I hope you've learned a little bit about how we make this stuff, what foods are involved, and that the yields are mathematically indistinguishable. And I hope we can now put that part to rest. Anybody have any complaints or questions still confused about yields of genetically engineered crops versus conventional? Wow, excellent, okay. How about costs? Uh-oh. Uh -oh. <laughs> I'm going to present this in terms of the consumer price index, and all of that means, ladies and gentlemen, is the cost of something at two points in time. That's all that is. Last year to this year, or last decade to this decade, two points in time, costs. So the overall CPI for everything that Americans buy went up only 45% during this 16-year uh, period. And that meant something that was 25 bucks in 90, 1995, now costs 36 in 2011. Okay, what about seeds? Whoops. Corn seed, $25 to $87.50. That went up 259% for American farmers. And if you add, you know, go to soybean, go to cotton, it gets ugly. Oh, by the way, these are all patented, so you, I'm sorry, Dave, you've got to pay a royalty fee to these people on top of the seed costs. Sorry. Uh, $60 <laughs> an acre for corn and a little bit more for cotton. And because of the 150 million acres of American farmland and GE crops, that amounts to about $8.7 billion a year. That's 8,700 million, and that's a lot of money. That could stand you on your head. Uh, I have, honestly, okay, I have seen two sets of information. One set says that in about nine years, the price of corn seeds for farmers went up 50%. And I will have to tell you that. I saw another sauce source that said in six years it tripled. Big difference. Bottom line, it went up at least 50%. How about commodities? Interestingly enough, CPI for foods went up 130%. Now overall, 45% for everything we buy, but just for foods, 130%. But, you know, if we're talking genetically engineered corn, it went up almost 300%. Uh, bottom line, non-genetically engineered wheat, 
about where everything else was, 140. GE, canola oil, canola oil derived from genetically engineered seeds, 230%. Peanut oil, 140. Olive oil, fortunately, uh, didn't uh, change much at all. So, got the point? There are a lot of things that impact the price of our food, supply and demand, of course. But consider the other possibilities involved here. Our farmers want to make money and there's nothing wrong with that. Just know that we're helping them. All right, quickly, roundup. Please know that due to the genetic designs of the crop products, when genetically engineered corn, soy, and friends came out, they were only resistant to 32 ounces of Roundup per acre. Now it's 96. And the reason why it's gone up is that the genes came from, back, uh, from plants at first, and then they came from bacteria. And the bottom line is, guess who gets to sell more herbicides? And guess who's using more herbicides? Farmers said, geez, before biotech, we only had one crop plane in the county. Now we've got seven or eight post-biotech. And yeah, there, you heard last night that we actually are using less pesticides. This data is from U.S. Department of Agriculture. I put on the red arrows just for fun. The blue line shows about a tenfold increase in the amount of Roundup that's being used. The starting with GMO is introduced here, 1996, 1998. Oh, and the red line happens to be documented problems with Roundup resistant weeds on American farmland. 90,000 tons of Roundup. <laughs> The weight of this ship is 76,000, just to kind of put it into perspective, because I don't know what 90,000 tons of Roundup looks like. This is the best I could do, folks. This true cruise ship weighs 76,000. Where does all of that stuff go? Edamame, soybean pods. And you ever had it? It's one of my favorites, or used to be anyway. It took Norwegian scientists to study what kind of Roundup concentrations we have in our soybeans. Why do you think it had to be done in Europe? Did I, do, you, do, do you remember what I told you earlier about patent protection? Yeah. Okay. It wasn't done by American scientists. So they collected samples of soy from 31 farms in Ohio. Uh, 11 was from organic farm operations, no detection of Roundup, and that's good, that's what we would have expected. 10 from conventional farms that happened to use chemicals other than Roundup, so no Roundup was detected. But in the Roundup resistant soy, yeah, it was there, three to eight parts per million, and the blue indicates kind of a fingerprint uh, of uh, Roundup was there, but the plane has converted it to a different chemical. But let's just go with the three to eight parts per million. What the heck does that mean to you and I? So we got Roundup, and we're eating the active ingredient, which is glyphosate. What does it mean? We don't know yet. But here's what we do know. Let's get sensitive with each other and talk amphibian and frog declines. Frogs are part of the natural cycle of all living things. They get eaten, and they eat insects, etc. Oh, by the way, there are species of frogs that we just need to love and protect because some of them make products that save human lives. For example, this yellow guy makes an antibiotic, sheds it or, or excretes it through its skin. And that antibiotic is special because it kills antibiotic resistant bacteria. It's a new class of antibiotics. Some of the frogs don't help us anymore because unfortunately they're gone. Uh, scientists who study these kinds of things say, hey, frogs are disappearing due to exploitation, new diseases, 
Uh, alien species are coming in and, and taking over the frog habitats, but most are dying because of pesticides and habitat change. Frogs are extremely sensitive to pesticides because they drink through their skin. So their whole body is exposed to adverse chemicals. I want you to know that. So if a frog dies following an exposure, it doesn't mean if you go swimming in the water of the same stuff, you're going to get sick. No, 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 no. Don't draw that conclusion. But draw the conclusion if the frog dies, there's poison in that water. And it may not be acute for you, but it, maybe it's going to do something to you over 30 years. Mm -hmm. Don't know that. We do know that some of these chemicals are called endocrine disruptors. Mm -hmm. That means it screws up the frog's hormones, and we get frogs that have extra legs or lack a leg. And also, we get what's called feminized frogs, where male frogs have not only sperm, but they also are showing female egg production in the same animal. It's called endocrine disruption, falling exposure to chemicals. What chemicals? What chemical do you think does that? Uh, more specific? Well, actually, it's one of the inert ingredients in Roundup that does that. An inert ingredient that's not regulated at all. Uh, OK, quickly, uh, over here, an experiment following exposure to 1.6 parts per million. Remember I said 3 to 8 parts per million in the soybeans? OK, so 1.6 part per million kills about 51 out of 60 frogs in this experiment. Whereas 59 out of 60 controls survived. So in other words, if we could figure out, as an example, how to extract the Roundup out of those soybeans and give it to these frogs, the same concentration, the three parts per million, they die. That's what three to eight parts per million of Roundup in soybeans means to native creatures. Disappearance of habitat, wow. Did you know that the ethanol production from corn starch fermentation took about 11 million acres of this kind of land out of wetlands? We used to protect wetlands. Uh, in the 80s, you remember, you took a one acre out of, wetland uh, out of wetlands, if you filled it in, you had to create an acre somewhere else, but apparently no more. If Congress wants ethanol to add to our gasoline. So 11 million acres went from this to this. The water was drained. The ponds filled in and put into agriculture. That means frog habitat no more. Simple, right? Frogs don't live here. Uh, let's go back to that three to eight parts per million of Roundup in soy and show you what happens to uh, trout. Young trout die when exposed to two and a half to three parts per million of Roundup. Earthworms stop growing here when exposed to similar concentrations of Roundup, but the controls continue to grow. Uh, oh, yes. And did you hear about how when it rains in the fawn belt, it rains Roundup? Yeah. That's the bad news. But the really bad news, it also rains about 30 other toxic poisons. An innocent bystander gets, is more or less sayonara. An innocent bystander in the Midwest because here you see something called a weed, milkweed. You know what eats milkweed? This is a horrible, dirty agricultural field of soybeans, by the way, and it shows you why Roundup is called the agricultural hero. I mean, you're hooked on it because it's going to kill off all of those weeds and allow you to grow your soybean crop and also take out milkweed. Well, that's what eats milkweed. Yeah. 
monarch butterfly. And this is what happens, or has happened to the numbers that go to the mountains of Mexico for the winter, to hibernate for the winter. We're down now to about 15 to 20 percent of the numbers we had at this time here. And guess what happened here? What happened here? You see the numbers going up, 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 and crash. And down, 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 down. What happened at that period of time? Okay, Roundup resistant management system started. Where do these butterflies live? Ah, in the farm belt. Oh, where all of these glyphosate resistant plants, weeds, have emerged. Well, does that mean the resistant weeds are killing off the monarchs? No. It means the Roundup that takes care of their food source is gone. And one of the byproducts is the Roundup resistant weeds. Okay, I'm trying to bring a correlation to a causation right now and show you what's happened to the milkweed relative numbers over the 10 or 11 year period. And when they drop 50% in the Midwest Farm Belt, egg production for monarchs dropped 50%. When the milkweed dropped to drop down 80% or 20% remain, 80% drop in egg production. And that simply means as the habitat, as the habitat on the milkweed declined. The monarchs weren't doubling up, tripling up, and laying eggs on the remaining plants. They just didn't lay the eggs. Okay, so they're not compensating for their loss of their habitat. And the end result is probably, according to the authors, American scientists who did the study, it'll get worse before it gets better. Sort of, bye-bye, monarch. Oh, one thing that I wanted to show you in that same field. Uh, I don't know if the light allows this, but there are some green plantlets that are emerging, two broadleafs and one blade of grass, that survived the blast of Roundup. Those are the potential Roundup resistant plants that will make themselves known in a couple of weeks. Maybe look like this. These survive treatment. These are the weeds that died. This is the soybean crop. And unfortunately, on a worst case basis, some farms have this. No crop, just weeds. About a week ago, I heard a presentation by a professor of agricultural economics uh, at Portland State University who just came back from a visit in uh, Georgia. And he said that there are major areas of farmlands in Georgia that have been abandoned due to intense weed, Roundup resistant weed production. Just walked away. Farmers can't control the problem. Where is, the, where is this problem going to go with weed resistance as it spreads, spreads, spreads more, more, more? Well, for now, Monsanto is encouraging financially farmers to use other herbicides until they come out with new crops that are resistant to other herbicides. Just like antibiotic resistance. You got an ear infection, you go to the doctor, you an antibiotic, and the week you go back and you say, Doc, I still, have it. I still have an earache, I need another antibiotic. Well, guess what, that second or third antibiotic is likely to have more side effects. Maybe you have diarrhea and you gotta stay home from work. It's also likely to cost you more. Yeah. The analogy is there, it's the same with regards to weed resistance. The farmer says, I need another chemical. Well, ha, seed company says, hold on, I'll sell you some 2,4-D. I'll sell you some isoxaflutol. I'll sell you some dicamin. So it's going to cost a little bit more, but it'll be effective. That's the analogy that we're looking at right now. 2,4-D, isoxaflutol, uh, garbage, dirty versions. I'm sorry to use that language. 
are available online directly now from China. A probable carcinogen that is going to be used probably this year called isoxaflutol. Uh, you can buy five metric tons a week out of China. Real cheap. Uh, it's going to go on our soybeans. And it will go very likely with glyphosate, the active ingredient in Roundup. So we'll have two chemicals coming. Maybe even a third one called mesotriol. That's possibility in order to control the weed problems. This, you know that this is not BS for me when I tell you and show you that Monsanto is paying one-third to one-fourth the cost to encourage farmers to use something other than Roundup. There is a big weed problem. They don't want to lose yields even further. They've got to control the weeds. And you know, it's getting late. I wanted to talk a little bit about cross-pollination. But by golly, I think Chris and Brian did a, a marvelous job on that. Uh, I just want to talk about this little piece of it, and then I'll be done. Ten years ago now, it's about the anniversary time, that my colleagues at the US EPA Research Laboratory in Corvallis published in the Proceedings of the National Academy of Sciences a very prestigious journal, the breakout of pollen from bent grass experiment in Deschutes County. It was an experiment overseen being run by Scott's Seed Company. They paid a half a million dollars for not knowing that their pollen was going to travel 13 miles, maybe more, off the plot, cross-fertilize wild weeds in Central Oregon, make the weeds round up resistant. Well, Scott's is back. They just had approval of Kentucky bluegrass, which is Roundup resistant, and it's coming to a market near you very soon. And why do I care about that, and why should you care? Quickly, this is what it looks like. And it blossoms and sets seed when it's very, very, very close to the ground. One inch, one inch high. It's already flowering and setting seed. So you set your mower down, down, lower, and lower, and lower, and lower. It's still going to select for plantlets that are going to be pollinating, cross-pollinating. It's a problem in our Midwest, and the Nature Conservancy has to burn it out of our natural prairie land, the little bit that's left. That's how it's controlled, by burning. Scott's and the industry is hoping that their new Roundup resistant bluegrass is so popular, it's going to go and take over more acreage than any crop plant has so far. Parks, golf courses, your backyard, your front yard, and so on. That's what they anticipate. My question is, OK, you forget to mow your front yard out here by the street. This is what it looks like. This is what it could look like in your lawn the little patches that have started to grow because the seed blew in from your neighbor's yard. Your neighbor thinks it's cute to have genetically engineered grass. It's not regulated. I guarantee you that's going to happen. And oh, by the way, grass-fed, organically raised cattle cannot eat genetically engineered grass. That is not going to be organic anymore. And if that isn't enough, I'm sorry, because I suffer from this problem. And we'll have it very soon. Grasses are the main cause of pollen allergies. And the worst offender is Kentucky bluegrass. <laughs> go, go to pollenlibrary.com, go to WebMD site, and look up bluegrass. That's where the information came from. And oh, by the way, any golfers here <laughs> know that in the early morning, your golf course is going to be freed of all weeds. Bringing it home <laughs> on your shoes, yeah. on your hands, on your golf ball, on your pants. Hopefully your wife isn't pregnant and you have no small children. This, 
Yes, Dave. Yeah. Hey, uh, they just sprayed uh, the front lawn of uh, Taylor Hall with glyphosate, and the sign to that effect. Oh, really? Yes. We'll just go out there and have a look right outside the studio. Uh, I know employees of Scott Seed have encouraged, been encouraged, and they get free seed to plant on their lawns, just to kind of get things started. So where do we go from here reminds me of the last speaker, Cy Weiss, who's going to tell you a little bit about where we're going to go from here. And I don't see him in the audience. I hope, ah, there he is. Okay, he's ready to go. So the question is, this is where we are today. Where do we go from here? Do we go to the farmer of the year in Ohio who has learned how to avoid the use of most of the pesticides that I've talked about through regenerative farming practices. All of it takes, according to him, is planting a cover crop. Generate soil, organic matter, has earthworms, holds the moisture, etc., etc. So as I finish you want a label? Leave the country. Bye-bye <laughs> Roundup. Hello Dicamba. Hello 2,4-D. And hello something called ISOX, which is a probable carcinogen, according to the EPA. Bye-bye Monarchs. Probably a lot more bye-bye frogs. All of this without the benefit of increased crop yields. I don't get it. So is all of this stuff good for our political and economical prowess? No. Ask your neighbor that question. And then tell them why you asked. So I'm going to end on that note. Please don't leave. I want you to hear what the next generation is doing about where do we go from here. A student here at Southern Oregon University. Cy, come on up and tell us. questions when Cy gets done. I don't want to take up any more of your time. So, um, as uh, Dr. Seidler said, I'm Cy Weiss, I'm a student here at Southern Oregon University, and um, myself and some of my colleagues have um, put together a uh, place where we focus on sustainability efforts here on campus, and it's called the Center for Sustainability, a Living Learning Laboratory. Um, I just want to give a shout out to Larry over here, our farm manager, he's also a student here at SOU. Um, and without him, we wouldn't be able to do the things that we do today, uh, as well as other nu numerous faculty and staff that has helped us pull our energy together to create this wonderful program. Um, as uh, Dr. Seidler said, he wanted to make his presentation about learning. I also want to echo that and say, I want to make this presentation about learning too, because here at Southern Oregon University, you know that we've had a deep commitment in um, becoming a teacher school, and from there we've grown, you know, even to a large institution to where um, we help to teach and create teachers here in the Rogue Valley. Um, so that being said, I'll start my presentation. So for the Center for Sustainability is a living learning laboratory, as I said, but I want to start from the basis of what is sustainable agriculture. So this is the definition that I pulled off of the USDA website. Um, sustainable agriculture is defined as a means of an integrated system of plant and animal production practices having a site-specific application that will, over the long term, satisfy human fiber needs, food and fiber needs, enhance environmental quality and the natural resource base upon which the agriculture economy depends, make the most efficient use of non-renewable resources and on-farm resources, and integrate where appropriate natural biological cycles and controls sustain the economic viability of farm operations, and lastly, enhance the quality of life for farmers and society as a whole. 
I kind of want to highlight that last term right here, enhance the quality of life for farmers and society as a whole, because what we want to do here at the center is do exactly just that. We want to bring community people from different facets of the community, both private, public, teachers, advocates, um, students, everyone together under one roof to discuss and um, create ideas and means for sustainability here in the Rogue Valley. Um, so next slide. And so our mission, that being said, the SOU Center for Sustainability is a living and learning laboratory for applied research and projects in sustainability. The center serves as a community resource for sustainability education, fosters sustainable business development, promotes interconnectedness, and facilitates leadership training through thoughtful learning and practice. So as myself, um, as a student doing a research project here at the university, it has become a great asset to the students here to be able to apply their, what we've learned in the classroom into the real world directly. So that being said, it is not just SOU that has created programs like this, but numerous universities like Oregon State, Portland State, um, uh, just to name a few here in Oregon, and in California, UC Davis, and, um, excuse me, what's the other one, in Berkeley as well. They all have their own student-run, um, sustainably-minded farm operations. So what we want to do is we want to bring that same key component to what they have at their universities here at SOU. And so, just to give you a little brief history of how the Center for Sustainability was formed, was um, spearheaded by a student named Sean Franks, who is not here today, but he and other colleagues went up to Portland State for the Oregon University System's first Oregon Social Business Challenge with a sustainable student farm project as a model for fighting local food insecurity. So, um, that being said, he met with Muhammad Yunus, I'm not sure if you know who he is, he's a Nobel laureate, um, and we presented the idea and made the final round for our um, Center for Sustainability. So uh, with that being said, we brought that back to the university and brought that energy and brought everyone together to put their effort in creating this larger program. So the, uh, where the Center for Sustainability is currently located is a five acre field adjacent to the Science Works Hands-On Museum. That is a perfect location for us because we work both symbiotically with the Science Center and with um, the Center for Sustainability in that we both get to be a learning tool for students and community members to learn um, both science-based practices and what sustainability is all about. So we have created seven student positions through the center, meaning that we've employed our own people within the university to create programs and to create jobs for students to be able to live and learn on this farm. So currently no one is living on the farm, but hopefully in the next couple of years we'll have students, a farm manager, living on the farm, growing local organic food. Um, so 20 Center for Sustainability volunteers, students, faculty, community members spent over 1,500 hours organizing, writing, researching, mapping, and meeting with partners and stakeholders. So currently we've received different donations from different organizations. I'm not gonna go in detail which, who has donated, but if you want that list, you can get that from me. Um, but nonetheless, it shows that it is not just SOU that is interested, but everyone else here in the Rogue Valley is interested in being a part and a stakeholder in the Center for Sustainability. So, Right here, I don't know how to work this laser thing. How do you do that? Oh, okay. Here it is. Thank you. Um, so right here is where the White House is located, which is where the, the potential student faculty workers will be living and working on this five-acre farm. Um, if you go down Walker Street, where the middle school is, and um, the John Muir Elementary School, on that street is where uh, the farm is located, and it is as uh, the pre the first talk. Sorry, I don't remember your name, but the first talk stated, you know, on Norval Street they have those sugar beets that are growing, the genetically modified sugar beets. That is also going to affect our farm here in um, so uh, in Ashland. So that is also a concern to us and how we are going to grow our food, our food, excuse me, in the future. 
So not just being a student-led farm, it is also going to be a place for learning. 